tendency to think that God's broken. And nowhere else does this come out more forthright than when we're in pain. The tendency is to think, I don't deserve this. I don't get this. And God, you must be broken. Because pain is no respecter of persons. Brokenness is no respecter of persons. It hits all of us from time to time. We don't know how this happened with Naaman. Maybe it started out as a rash that he went to get checked out. And by the end of the week, the doctors are looking at him saying, there's nothing more we can do. There's nothing more we can do for you. Pain's no respecter of of persons. And yet from the the Christian perspective, in a kind of weird way, pain is a gift. James would say, count it all joy, brothers, when you face trials of every kind. It's an interesting idea because we, we do everything in our world we can do today to numb ourselves from pain. Just walk down any Walgreens or CVS, you'll see aisles and aisles of pain medications. Now, I'm not against medication for pain, you know, but if you've got a headache, you take a t- Tylenol. If you've got indigestion, take a Tums. If you've got, if you've got uh, uh, muscle pain, take an Advil. We live in a world that tries to numb our pain, and it is no coincidence. Coincidence, I don't think that in a world that's numbing its pain, that it also is in some way numbing its passion. Because literally, the root word of passion is about pain. We don't know what to do with our pain. And so we try and numb it, we try and get away from it, but we forget that, that pain is a, is a gift to us because pain allows us to see that there is something broken, that we're broken, that the world is broken, and there's all kinds of pain. There's the pain of consequence where my life falls apart because of good decisions that I make. There's the pain of suffering when my life falls apart because of good decisions that I make. Consequence, my life falls apart because of bad decisions that I make. Suffering is what happens when my life falls apart because of good decisions that I make. And sometimes we we look up at God in the middle of these painful experiences and say, you just must not be good. If you were good, you would take the pain away, God. Why is there so much pain? But I got a question for you tonight. If there was no pain and you never experienced brokenness of any kind, how in the world would you and I know that we are broken? How would we have any inclination that the world is broken? See, i got to tell you, there's one thing worse than being broken, and that is being broken and not knowing it. And in the midst of a world that experiences pain that sometimes feels random, it's like a gift to us, a sign to let us know there is something not right here, that something is incredibly wrong. That God is not the author of that pain, but neither does he take all pain away. But in the midst of that pain, he stirs us at the core of who we are to let us know that the world is broken, that we are broken. See, it's easy to say the world is broken. What's hard is to say Dave is broken. I'm just good at seeing what I want to see, thinking that I'm perfect and God's broken. If I'm not careful, it's in these moments that instead of stumbling toward God, I'll walk away from God. Naaman's story continues. Verse 2, it says, Now bands from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. 
Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl had said. By all means, the king of Aram replied, I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 sets of clothing. The letter they took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him. So Naaman gets this moment from this, this girl who happens to be in his house because he's taken her captive. He says, if only you could get back to Samaria. Where's Samaria? It's just some area out there. It's just out there in Israel. And so Naaman, he gets this word, and he, he does what anyone would do in this moment. He leverages all of his resources. He, he comes, and he, he, he takes lots of money and lots of other things. And he goes to the king of Israel. The king of Israel gets into a crisis moment. He's like, I don't know how to heal you of this, but there's this one guy named Elisha. Verse 9, it says, So Naaman went with his horses and his chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. So here we find Naaman in the middle of this broken situation He's got a little girl that's saying, if you could just get to this prophet in Samaria, he could heal you. And so Naaman, he's a guy who knows how to get things done. He goes and he leverages all of his resources, all of his assets. And he gets there finally to Elisha. And he's got some expectations that Elisha refuses to meet. Have you ever been in a place where where you wanted one thing to happen and and something else happened, where where something happened that was nothing like you planned it? Uh, We we often, with our kids, will pray with them before they go to bed, and every once in a while we'll we'll do some devotions with them, and, and every once in a while one of our kids will ask to pick a scripture and read it. When my little girl Emma, who's now 14, was about seven years old, I was putting her to bed one night, and she said, Dad, let me read. Let me read the Bible tonight for us. I thought this would be amazing. This would be a great time. And, and so she opens her Bible up to 1 Kings chapter 1, just kind of flips it there, and she says, oh, I love 1 Kings, I love 1 Kings. And I was like, oh, well, I didn't know that, but that's amazing, you know? And she starts reading in our family devotion time from 1 Kings chapter 1, and she says, when King David was old and well advanced in years, he could not keep warm even when they put covers over him. So his servant said to him, let us look for a young virgin to attend the king and take care of him. She can lie beside him so that our Lord the King may not keep, may, may keep warm. What do you do in a moment like that? We just decided to go straight to prayer. And I know some of you guys are thinking, I just found my life verse. That's my life verse right there. But this is the kind of moment that, that Naaman has happened. He, he, he's expecting one thing. And God's not meeting him like he thinks God should meet him. Elisha's not meeting him the way that he thinks Elisha should meet him. Naaman's expectation is that Elisha's going to come out and he's going to wave his hand over the spot and everything's going to be healed. But Elisha comes out to him and says, here's what you need to do. You need to go down to the waters of the Jordan and you need to dip down seven times. And Naaman's sitting there thinking, the Jordan? That's a dirty river. Why why am I going to go in the Jordan in my town? We got rivers. And they're amazing rivers. Can I I just wash in those rivers? Here God is trying to, to move in Naaman's life, but there's this obstacle of Naaman's pride in the midst of his brokenness. He's got a way that he wants God to work. He's got an expectation that he wants God to move in. And when God doesn't move the way he wants, when God doesn't work the way he wants, he almost, in his anger, misses God. Now we got a feel for Naaman here. I mean, you got to feel like... like challenge to Naaman's pride is here. I mean, this would be like 
Nick Saban from the University of Alabama going to God saying, God, we want to win a national championship. And God coming to Nick Saban saying, have you seen what Gus Malzahn is doing at Auburn? You need to go down there and learn from him. It would be like Dabo Sweeney coming to God and saying, God, we want to to win a national championship at Clemson. God saying, have you seen what Will Mess Champ is doing down at South Carolina? You should go to one of those little spring practices and take a look. It would be like God coming to Kevin Sumlin from Texas A&M and him saying, we would like at some point to win a national championship here. And God's saying, well, what you need to do, have you heard of Tom Herman? I don't, many people haven't. He, he's, he's down at Texas, and, and what you need to do is go watch the way that he runs an offense and learn from him. It's, it's a pride swallower. And Naaman, in his pride, the Bible says, in his rage, because God's not doing what he wants, when he wants, just begins to take off, and in his rage, he almost misses what God will do. Some of you are here tonight, and the brokenness that is in your life, the pain that you found yourself in or the pain that you found your friends in has made you so angry. And here's the deal. It's okay to be angry. It's okay. It's part of the grieving process when bad things happen to be angry. But I just want to implore you tonight, don't miss God in your anger. You can look up at God, and and I've had moments in my life where it feels like my dreams are being crushed and dying. I remember playing soccer in college. I was the rookie of the year our first year, training for my sophomore year. I tore my ACL, came all the way back from that, was named captain of the team, tore my ACL again as my junior year, and I can remember for six months looking at God saying, I don't get you. You say you're good. All my heathen buddies, their knees work well. My knee doesn't work good. God's not asking you not to be angry. Can I just suggest to you, God's angry at the pain in this world. God's heart bursts and breaks for the pain in this world. God's not up in heaven saying, hey, let's just teach him some character and give him some pain. God is deeply hurt at the brokenness of this world, and he's okay with you getting angry, but what he doesn't want you to do is miss him in your pain. Some of you are here, and you're sitting there thinking, if my mom and dad wouldn't have just gotten this divorce, or if this wouldn't have happened, or if this wouldn't have happened, and God, I don't get you, and some of you, you're so angry, And sometimes it's on the outside, and sometimes it's just festering on the inside. And if you and I aren't careful, when God doesn't work exactly like we want, when we want, we will miss him in our pain, and we'll miss the gift of pain in our lives. Naaman's about to write off in a rage when all of a sudden his servants come to him. Look at verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots. I'm sorry, verse verse 13. He's about to ride off in a rage, verse 12, verse 13. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there's no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me take, let me, your servant, be given uh, as, much as, a, uh, as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings or sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I bow down there also, when I bow down the temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha says. 
So you get the picture here. Naaman is so mad. He's got some expectations that aren't getting met. He's writing off in a rage. He's about to miss God when all of a sudden some of his his servants come to him and say, hey, dad. And they call him like the, the word for dad. Dad. If the prophet would have told you to do something amazing, you would have done it. If he would have asked for everything that you brought, you would have given it to him. So why not? Why not just take a chance on God? Just go down. It's just seven dips. It's just seven dips in the water. Just take a chance on God. Naaman goes down into the river, and the first time he goes down into the water, nothing. The second time, nothing. And the third time, nothing. And the fourth time, nothing. And the fifth time, nothing. Six times, nada. You ever felt that way with God? You're trying to follow what God is asking you to do, and you're trying to seek after him. And, and you got to imagine this is what the people of Israel felt like when they walked around the walls of Jericho, and God said, I'm going to crash the walls down. First time, nothing. Second time, nothing. Third time, nothing. Sixth time, nada. You gotta imagine this is what Elijah felt like when he's praying to God for rain and seven times or six times he sends the prophet out to say, are there any things, any clouds? And if Naaman's like me in this moment, I can imagine his internal dialogue. What's going on, God? I don't get you, God. Are you picking on me, God? You say you're good, God, but it doesn't look good now, God. I'm walking around these walls, God. When these walls going to fall, God, I'm looking like a fool, God. When you coming through, God. But on the seventh time, on the seventh time, Seventh time they walk around the walls of Jericho. The seventh time that Elijah prays. The seventh time that Naaman goes down in the water. He comes up and he is fully restored. This is what God does best. He meets us at the end of ourselves. He meets us in the midst of our pain. C.S. Lewis says God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he yells to us in our pain. That it's in our pain that we hear the voice of God raised in our life, that it's in our brokenness that we find out just how beautiful God is, that God meets us, and sometimes it means walking around the walls six times and seeing nothing. Sometimes it means going down six times and seeing nothing. Sometimes it means praying six times and seeing nothing. But the good news of the Bible over and over and over and over again is that God is working and God is moving and even in the midst of the pain even in the midst of the seeming nothingness it's not because God is aloof it's not because God's not concerned it's not because God doesn't care it's not because God doesn't see and that just in time At just the right time, the way the New Testament writers would talk about it, at the appointed time, at the anointed time, God will move and he steps into the brokenness and he makes it beautiful again. Like I said last night, if it's not good yet, then God's not done. Some of you are here and you tried the God thing. You went down one time. You prayed one time. You walked around the walls one time. And when God didn't show up like you wanted him to, you just stopped walking and you stopped going under and you stopped praying. And maybe there's, there's someone here tonight that in the midst of the brokenness of your life, you just say, God, maybe, maybe, maybe what I could do tonight is just say, why not just take a chance on God? I know you've been let down in the past. I, I, I know you've prayed and nothing's happened. 
I, I know you, you've, you've, you've dreamt for something greater and it felt like you were still locked in to your own captivity, but why not? Why not just one more chance on God? Because here's the thing, here's the thing, guys. If there's no God, some of you might be here and you're just saying, you know what, the reason I don't believe in God is because of all the pain, but here's the deal. If there's no God, there's still pain. I love Philip Yancey in his book, Disappointment with God. He says, really, you got two options. You can either be disappointed with God or you can be disappointed without God. You still got the issue of pain. You still got the issue of brokenness. You just have no one to bring it to. So just because you get rid of God doesn't mean you get rid of pain. But what it means for us as Christians is that now we have purpose in the pain, in the midst of the brokenness, in the midst of all those moments where it looks like God's not doing anything. What we find is God is forming us into the kind of people who are passionate about the things that matters most. Here's the way James talks about it. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That God is not the author of your pain. That God's not sitting up in heaven saying, Let's give him cancer to teach him some character. But what over and over in scripture we see is that God enters into our pain, that he takes our brokenness upon himself, that he allows us to see how broken our world is, how broken we are, and here's how good he is. He begins to make it beautiful. Naaman's skin here becomes like that of a baby infant, and he makes it even better than it was before the brokenness, so much so that you look at it and think, God must have orchestrated that. That is not a testimony to God's causation. It is of this testimony to how good God's redemption is. He's not the author of this stuff. He's not the author of your tragedy. He's not the author of your hard times. But in the midst of those hard times, he comes to you and he says, in the midst of your brokenness, let me speak into it. Let me touch it. Let me mold it. And when he gets done, it's so good that you look back and think it had to happen that way. And sometimes God steps into our natural life and the supernatural manifests and the brokenness is healed instantly. Now Naaman, it's important to know, he, he's not really seeking God in this story. He's just seeking healing. But in the midst of seeking healing for his brokenness, he finds God. Now, he's not a perfect disciple. When you read this, you know, he says, I want to give the prophet all my stuff. And the prophet says, no, there's no need for that. And he says, well, give me a plot of ground. Give, give me some ground that I can take back. And the reason he's doing that is because in Naaman's day, they thought God's just kind of had spatial territory so that you could only worship God on his territory. So what he's saying is, give me some of this God's territory and I'll bring it back to my territory so that I can go in and worship God and make an altar on that territory. And then he's saying, you know, there's also this moment where I'm going to be in the temple of Rimon and my, my king's going to bow, so just let the Lord forgive me. And, and I love Elisha's moment here. He doesn't correct Naaman's theology. He could have. He doesn't correct Naaman's theology. He, he just says, go in peace. He, here's Naaman. He doesn't have his, his whole act together. At his best, he's just stumbling toward God. You know, it's coming Father's Day this weekend, and, and, and uh, maybe you, you didn't know that. Maybe this is just a good heads up for you to think about what you're going to do for your dad. But a couple years ago, my, my daughter, Izzy, um, gave me a Father's Day card. And, and we're going to put this up on the screen. It said, Happy Father's Day. So she put an R in there. 
I'm just glad she left the H in there, actually, because that would have been a whole different set of issues. But you, you know what I didn't do? I, I didn't take Izzy aside and say, Izzy, I can't believe you put an R in father. You know what I did as her dad? I accepted this gift as what it was. Look here, look here, students, look here, look here. In your pain right now, you may not have a pristine theology. You may have some things out of whack. You may be at your best. This is his name. At his best, he is stumbling toward God. He's not a perfect man of faith. He's got flaws, but he's beginning to orient himself toward God in his pain. You don't have to be perfect. God's not concerned simply about your perfection. He's concerned about your orientation like all good fathers are. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, God is easy to please, but hard to satisfy. That God is easily pleased with our first stumbling steps toward him but he's not satisfied until he completes his work in us. And some of you are here tonight, and the truth is, you can't walk toward God, but maybe tonight, for the first time in your life, you could stumble into the grace of God. I'm not asking you to check out with all your questions. I'm not asking you not to ask your questions. I'm not asking you to not have doubt. I'm asking you to come to God with your doubt. I'm asking you to come to God with your questions. Faith is not simply the opposite of doubt. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. God often uses our doubt to bring us to greater faith in him. Richard Foster says that sometimes God purifies our faith by threatening to destroy our faith. That sometimes it's in these seasons of doubt. And by the way, doubt is different from disbelief. Doubt is when you want to believe, but you're struggling to believe. Disbelief is when you don't want to believe. And you're looking for any reason not to believe so that God meets us in our doubt. But Jesus has little time for disbelief. And maybe you're here tonight. Maybe you've got all kinds of questions. Maybe you've been checked out of God for a while. Maybe in the midst of your pain, you're almost going to miss God. And my heart would be for you tonight, just stumble toward God tonight. Just stumble toward him in your pain. You might not have it all worked out, but just take a chance on God. But I can't leave tonight without telling you about who I think the real hero of this story is. It's this little girl that we read about at the beginning of the story. Here, the only reason she's in this story is because God hasn't come through for her yet. Naaman has gone and captured her and taken her into his household. She's Naaman's slave girl. But she knows she's not a servant of Naaman. No, like James, she knows she's a servant of God. The only reason she's in the story is because God has not yet come through for her. But here is this little girl. This is what faith looks like. This is what James will call us to this week. That in the midst of our pain, here's what we find with God. Sometimes God steps in and heals our wounds. And sometimes God uses our wounds to heal others. Sometimes God breaks in and does the miraculous. And I got to tell you, I've seen it. I've been 18 months months, dealing with infertility with my wife, gone through all the specialists, heard my wife cry out to me and say, I don't get God in this moment. I've got this passion to birth kids, and he's either got to take the passion away, or he's got to do something about this, and I've struggled in those moments. I've walked around the walls six times, and I've also seen a moment where we went in front of our church, and they prayed for us after we were done with the infertility process, and 12 days later, she gets pregnant, and God does the miraculous, and the infertility doctors say, we have no idea where the egg came from. I've seen God step into those moments. But I gotta tell you, I've also been in other moments like my knee surgery where God never really healed my knee. But instead, what he began to do is heal my withered heart and invite me to become a wounded healer. Sometimes God heals our wounds and sometimes he uses our wounds to heal others. And by the way, he is healing everything. 
The Bible's word is that not even death can keep the healing action from God from working. In fact, the picture of heaven is this, that in heaven there will be no one with any wounds except for one person named Jesus, and from his wounds will come the healing of all the nations. So sometimes God heals our wounds and sometimes God fans the flame of our passion by saying, Dave, I invite you through the cross with Jesus to allow your brokenness to bring beauty to those around you because here's the deal, God. Here's the deal, guys. When your life is going good, the world may take notice, but when your life falls apart and you still follow God, the world can't help from watching it. So I don't know what brokenness you're in here tonight with. I've seen God do the miraculous both in my physical body and also in the places that I wasn't sure I wanted him to work. I've seen him heal my wounds, but I have also seen him invite me to be a wounded healer. And I want to tell you the reason I'm up here speaking is because in that moment where God didn't heal my knee like he wanted to, like I, like, he wanted, like I wanted him to. He changed my passion. So what I do is I feel like I coach the Bible. That's what I do. I coach the Bible. And maybe, maybe just sometime this week, I pray that God might even take these wounds, and it still hurts. When I watch the U.S. men's national team, it still hurts to watch pain's not totally gone. But it's in the midst of those wounds. It's in the midst of that identity crisis. The soccer field was the only place I knew that I was good. And then it was gone. I'm looking up. It's inviting me. It's God inviting me not to be a servant of pain. Not to be a servant of Naaman. But to be a servant of God and to say, God, I'm coming to you with my pain and with all my questions, and I'm walking around the walls, and I'm believing they're gonna fall. But like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm choosing to say, even if he does not, I'm not going anywhere else with my pain. And I'm trusting God that you can make me a wounded healer. It is worth it. It is worth it. So I don't know where your pain points are. I don't know where your brokenness lies. But I invite you to a God tonight who is not the author of that, but will use it to complete his work in you. So you don't have to live your life in apathy, but instead his passion can be poured through you. Look here, look here, last thing. There is something worse than suffering, you know, right? And that is having nothing in your life worth suffering for. So I'm asking you tonight, what will you do with your pain? Don't miss God in your rage. Let's pray. God, in a room like this, in the midst of what some people have talked about as the hurt generation,
be crazy to think that there aren't pains, unanswered prayers, anger, rage, medicated apathy, doubt, disbelief, everything in between. God, all over this camp tonight through tomorrow as we talk in Bible study, we're choosing, Jesus, to let your wounds heal us and to let our wounds through you be a catalyst of change and healing to others. In other words, Jesus, we're choosing as a camp to follow you, not just to the cross, but through the cross. We're choosing not to hide our questions from you, but to direct them toward you, and sometimes even at you. We're thankful that you're a God who is big enough for all of those questions. That makes room for our doubt and insecurity. That sees our tears and feels our outrage. And I'm praying, God, that the pain that is in this room would become passion. Let us be anything but an apathetic generation, numbing our pain. But instead, may our pain be for the healing of the nations, for the healing of our own hearts. Meet us tonight, God in the midst of all the pain points of our lives. For the person in this room who's going to have the courage to maybe walk around the walls one more time, go down one more time. For the person in this room who will choose to identify just as your servant and say, God, even if you don't heal me, I'm trusting you're going to use my Wounds for the healing of others. God, bring us some disciples who will not walk away from you in the midst of pain. But instead, this test will become their greatest testimony. As you shout, through the pain of their lives to a broken world in need of believing that things can be made beautiful again. Let the presence of your gospel take root in us. We love you. In your name, amen.